In this series, we are going to focus on thyroid cancer. However, before we delve into these specific types of thyroid cancer, let's first review our workup of the thyroid nodule, which is often going to be a piece of the presentation in patients with malignancies of the thyroid. Generally speaking, if we have a patient with a thyroid nodule, our first step in the workup is going to be to get an ultrasound of the thyroid as well as a TSH. From there, if the TSH is low, we should get a radionucleotide uptake scan. And if this scan ultimately shows a hot thyroid nodule, then we should simply treat the patient for their hyperthyroidism. However, if this scan shows that the thyroid nodule is not hot or that it is cold, then from there we should get an FNA or a fine needle aspiration. On the other hand, going back to the start of our workup, if from this TSH that we initially get in our patients, it is found to be normal or high, we then need to take a closer look at the ultrasound to see if it is concerning in terms of its features. If we see a nodule that is greater than one centimeter with calcifications, irregular margins, or internal vascularity, or if we see a non-cystic nodule that is greater than two centimeters, then we are more concerned about it being malignant and therefore ultimately proceed to a fine needle aspiration. From there, our management depends on what we see on that FNA. If the FNA shows that this has benign features, we can simply continue to monitor the lesion. However, if the lesion is found to be malignant on the FNA, then ultimately these patients are going to need surgery, often in the form of a partial or complete thyroidectomy. If the FNA is indeterminate, then we can perform a radionucleotide scan if we have not performed this already. And in the case of having an inadequate specimen, then we should first repeat the FNA before determining whether or not this patient is going to need surgery. So overall, there are really two pathways that get us to this fine needle aspiration or FNA. The first is that we perform an RAI scan and find that the nodule is not hot, or that it is cold, or we see initially from the ultrasound that the lesion is concerning for malignancy based on these features. And from that FNA, in most cases, we will be able to determine whether or not this thyroid nodule is malignant. However, in some cases, we will not be able to tell until we have a surgical or biopsy sample. More on this in our module on thyroid nodule. Without further ado, let's delve into our first type of thyroid cancer, which is papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. In the case of papillary cancer of the thyroid, our classic patient is going to be a female with a slow-growing thyroid nodule. Additionally, these patients may present in some cases with lymphadenopathy on physical exam. This is in part because papillary cancer of the thyroid moves via lymphatic spread, and it should be noted that patients are at an increased risk for papillary cancer of the thyroid if they have RET or BRAF mutations, or if they have a history of childhood radiation, especially to the neck. In order to diagnose papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, we're going to need a tissue sample, which is going to reveal orphan antinuclei, more on this in the coming slides. These orphan antinuclei classically will have empty appearing nuclei with a central clearing. Additional features that we will see histopathologically in our patients with papillary cancer of the thyroid include somoma bodies and nuclear grooves. Again, more on this in the coming slides. Much like our other types of thyroid cancers, the hallmark of management in papillary cancer of the thyroid is going to be either a partial or total thyroidectomy. Additionally, for high-risk patients, we can supplement surgery with the use of radioiodine ablation, as well as giving levothyroxine in order to suppress the patient's TSH. This decreases the amount of TSH stimulation of the thyroid, thus increasing our chances of ultimately getting rid of this tumor of the thyroid. This is because we do not want continued TSH stimulation of the thyroid when that is the very tissue that we are trying to get rid of. As we stated previously, papillary carcinoma of the thyroid has these classic histopathologic features. As we stated, we can see the presence of orphan antinuclei. These can be appreciated, for example, here, where we can see this central clearing. This is pretty classic for orphan antinuclei. Additionally, these patients may have somoma bodies histopathologically, and we will show examples of this in the coming slides. And last but not least, we can see nuclear grooves in our patients with papillary cancer. 
And we can see a couple examples of this. For example, here, where you can see this linear groove or nuclear groove, and this is highly classic for papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Somoma bodies are also another characteristic histopathologic feature that we see in papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, and this can be appreciated in this classic histopathologic image here on the right-hand side of the presentation, where we essentially have these concentric loops. Somoma bodies can be found in several high-yield conditions that love to show up on board examinations, and these can be remembered by the mnemonic PSMM, as these letters appear quite literally in the word somoma bodies. These high yield conditions include papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, serous papillary, cystoadenocarcinoma of the ovary, meningioma, as well as mesothelioma. Moving on to follicular carcinoma of the thyroid, this is once again going to present as a slow growing thyroid nodule. And because this tends to be a slow growing cancer, it tends to pretend a good prognosis. Unlike papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, follicular carcinoma spreads via hematologic spread, and additionally, patients will have an increased risk of the development of follicular carcinoma of the thyroid if they have RAS mutations. Histopathologically, follicular carcinoma of the thyroid will show follicular cells under the microscope, which tend to be pretty well differentiated. This can be appreciated in the specimen here on the right-hand side of the presentation, where these essentially look like follicular cells, albeit with a bit less organization and different sizes. Therefore, if we were to perform an FNA and it showed follicular cells, we wouldn't know whether we were looking at normal thyroid tissue or follicular carcinoma of the thyroid, as we would need to be able to see this tissue sample in order to clinch the diagnosis. Therefore, if we get an FNA in a patient and this suggests follicular carcinoma of the thyroid, we are going to need a tissue sample, often with a partial or total lobectomy, in order to establish the diagnosis of follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. And ultimately, our management for these patients is going to be with a thyroidectomy, be it partial or total. Next, we have medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, which classically will present as an asymptomatic thyroid nodule. This also tends to have a good prognosis. The pathophysiology of the medullary carcinoma of the thyroid can be sporadic in nature. However, this is related to the RET proto-oncogene, which is ultimately what gives rise to the multiple endocrine neoplasia, or MEN, syndromes. More on this in the coming slides. Therefore, in patients with suspected medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, the family history is going to be essential, as we may see evidence in their family history of one of these MEN syndromes. One of the keys to the diagnosis of medullary carcinoma of the thyroid especially on examinations, is that these patients are going to have the presence of calcitonin-producing C-cells. Generally speaking, these patients are going to have normal levels of calcium when you actually measure their serum calcium level. However, if you obtain a serum calcitonin, this will classically be elevated in patients with medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, and this is extremely high yield for examination purposes. Additionally, this calcitonin will come in handy later after we resect the tumor via total thyroidectomy and lymph node dissection. We can then follow the level of this calcitonin, which was previously elevated, and watch as it hopefully drops and stays low over time once the patient is in remission. In addition to calcitonin, we can also follow CEA, also known as carcinoembryonic antigen. But really the highest you'll take away from this medullary carcinoma of the thyroid is its relationship to the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes via the RET proto-oncogene, as well as the fact that these patients classically will have an elevated level of calcitonin. Just to briefly review here are MEN syndromes. In MEN 2A, our classic features are going to include pheochromocytomas, medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, as well as parathyroid hyperplasia, whereas in MEN2B, we may see pheochromocytomas as well as medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, but these patients characteristically may also have oral or intestinal neuromas, as well as a Marfanoid habitus, in which they have some of the physical exam features of Marfan syndrome, such as elongated limbs and tall stature. While papillary, follicular, and medullary carcinomas of the thyroid have been slower growing in nature and have pretended a good prognosis, 
anaplastic or undifferentiated carcinoma of the thyroid is not going to follow this trend. Patients with anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid classically will be an older patient who presents with a rapidly enlarging thyroid mass. Because this mass is so rapidly enlarging, this can ultimately lead to compression of local structures, leading to dysphagia, hoarseness, and even asphyxiation. Anaplastic carcinomas of the thyroid tend to co-occur with other thyroid cancers. Histopathologically, we are going to see poorly differentiated cells, which classically will stain positive for the presence of PAX-8. In terms of management, anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid is going to require chemotherapy and radiation, and in some cases, we may also perform local surgery. However, overall, the prognosis for patients with this condition is extremely poor. Last but not least, we have thyroid lymphoma, which, much like anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid, is going to present with a rapidly expanding neck mass. Because this neck mass is rapidly expanding, this can also lead to the compression of local structures, leading to dysphagia, hoarseness, and asphyxiation. The underlying pathophysiology of thyroid lymphoma, especially for examinations, is long-term Hashimoto thyroiditis. These patients may have Hashimoto thyroiditis over the course of decades prior to developing lymphoma of the thyroid. This lymphoma, in most cases, on FNA, is going to be a B-cell lymphoma, which is a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And this is in contrast to anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid, where we will simply see poorly differentiated cells, which stand positive for PAX-8. And therefore, we can really only distinguish anaplastic carcinoma and thyroid lymphoma based on the histopathology, as these both tend to occur in older patients and both present with a rapidly expanding thyroid mass with compression of local structures. In order to manage these patients, we can utilize CHOP, which is our chemotherapy regimen of cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisone. These patients may also benefit from radiation and surgery, although once again, this carries a poor prognosis. That'll do it for now in our discussion of these malignancies. If you can differentiate these various cancers of the thyroid, and you have a strong understanding of how to work up a thyroid nodule, then you will be in excellent shape for crushing these questions on your examinations. This is Boards MD, and this is Thyroid Cancer.